Shalom and welcome. You're listening to Temple Talk from Jerusalem, Israel, from the Temple Institute. Rabbi Chaim Richmond here and Yitzchak Ruvain today, the 23rd day of the month of Tishrei, 5776. It's October 6, 2015. This week we're starting it all over again. Parshat Breshit, Genesis, starting from the very beginning of the Torah. Welcome to the first program not really, of 5776. In a way, it feels like it because the programs that we had from, you know, Rosh Hashanah, <clears throat> that very highly charged time of repentance, the 10 days of repentance leading up to Sukkot, it's all kind of like pre-year in a way, but now is when the year really starts, now that the festivals are behind us. And what I mean by that is that now we are back down to earth because we were going through the most intense process Beginning really in the summer, beginning with the destruction of the temple, beginning with the month of Av, the, we began the tikkun, the spiritual rectification of all of the, the, the things that we're working on in our own lives, in our relationships, in our relationship with God. And then we have this month, Yerach Etanim, this month of the forefathers, this month so totally charged with spiritual energy. Come through Rosh Hashanah, come through Yom Kippur, we're born again, we have this incredible new opportunity. We sit in the sukkah for seven days. It is reminiscent of two things. It's reminiscent of the boots that we, that we sat in when we were taken out of Egypt by the Almighty. It's reminiscent of the clouds of glory that, that uh, were actually implanted over those boots. And we're sitting there in the sukkah during those seven days, and we are absolutely above this world, absolutely ensconced with the light of the divine presence. And then, of course, at the end of Sukkot, there's one day, which is mentioned in Leviticus 23, of course. It's called Shmini Atzeret. It is the eighth day of assembly, and it's not really related to Sukkot. It's a completely different holiday. It's a day of just, you know what? During Rosh Hashanah, we had the Shofar. We were busy with repentance on Yom Kippur. We were busy with repentance on, on Sukkot. We have the four species that we make the blessing over and bring the divine light into the world. We sit in the Sukkah. And then comes this, this special day of Shemini Atzeret, the eighth day of assembly, put down the species, we come out of the sukkah, and there's nothing, there's no, there's no vessel. We don't need anything. We're so, it's so above everything. It's just the Torah itself. That's the same day in Israel as Simchat Torah, the day that we dance with the Torah today being here in Israel, Isru Chag, which means the day following the festival. But in the diaspora today is still the second day of the, of the, of the second end of the festival. I want to say, though, you know, when we leave the sukkah, there's a prayer that we say. It's very beautiful. And for, for a lot of people, that's a very emotional, intense time when we leave the sukkah for the last time of the year. And we make that blessing one more time over something to eat. And we sanctify God that he gave us the commandment of dwelling in the booth. There's a special prayer that we say that's printed in the finer prayer books that talks about um, you know, the end of the prayer is may we merit to sit in the in the sukkah made by the Leviathan um, in the in the rectified worlds. But we also say, you know, in that prayer we say, may we stay forever young. Those are literally the words in the prayer that we ask Hashem to renew our youth. And we also say, may the angels that we have created through all the special mitzvot, through all the positive deeds that we did over these days, we created angels, we created uh, spiritual beings. We say, as we leave the sukkah, we say, may they accompany us into the house. And, and what it really is on a very simple level, the idea is that, that over this period of time, the past few weeks, we have achieved, hopefully, a new consciousness, a new level of consciousness. And that level of consciousness, we really, it was really um, anchored for us in the sukkah. Because there's no place like the sukkah, except, of course, the holy temple, 
And today, the, the closest brush that you can have with the experience of the Divine Presence in the Holy Temple is in your own sukkah. There's no, no place like the sukkah for making us realize on, in the deepest way possible that God is always with us. And that's the whole iconography of what it means to sit in a sukkah in this world. You know, it's a little bit, it's a wee bit shaky. You can see the stars through the thatched roof. It lets the light in, it lets the elements in. So it's a wee bit windy, but that's what it is to be out there in the world. God is all around us anyway, even if we, you know, are, we feel like we're vulnerable, you know, we're never really vulnerable. I'll get to that in a minute. So what that, what our, what that prayer that we say in the Sukkah, I want to say, what, it, what, it, what it's really all about when we talk about, you know, that the angels that we created through our positivity, may they accompany us now as we go back into the home. What we really are saying is, you know what? You know what we've learned during this past week especially? We learned how God is really so close to us, closer than we could have imagined, and we hope that that feeling stays with us all throughout the year. Amen. And so here we are now beginning, and this is, of course, the real challenge. The real challenge is what kind of a year is this going to be? And you know what? It's like when we talk about, about like making God sovereign on Rosh Hashanah and then the the service of the re- of the repentance that we do over Yom Kippur, the thing about repentance that's so cool, the thing about teshuva, is that you don't really know if you did it until later, <laughs> until you continue the course of the year, because the proof of whether or not we succeeded is how we act as we continue, because the, the only real proof of whether or not we were sincere and real in those moments of self-awareness and reckoning is when we are faced with the exact same situation again, whether it's something between us and ourselves, whether it's something between us and our fellow man, whether it's something between us and God that no other person is, bears witness to, when we're placed in that same situation again, we have the same ability that we had, or disability that is, that we had before to either do or not do the right thing, and we, and we stand strong, and we have a sincere resolve, and we're not gonna do it again or not do it again, that means that it that it's real. So you're not going to really know that it's real until it happens. So too, we're not going to know if we really did this tikkun and we made Hashem more of an integral part of our lives as we felt so strongly in the sukkah. We're not going to know until we continue throughout the year and see what kind of lives we lead, God willing. And I have to say that now, this week, we face, once again, the most sublime, the most exciting, the biggest mystery of all, and that is how it is that we will be starting to read the Torah all over again, the creation of the world all over again. I just can't get over that year after year. I mean, and besides the fact that there's so much happening in the first Torah portion of the year, the world is created from nothing. What is that called? Ex nihilo? And then... (laughs) And then by the end of the Torah portion, things went south, pardon me for all those that live in the south, so, so drastically that God literally, if such a thing is possible to say, regrets that he did it in the first place, that he created the world, and he decides to destroy it. So there's a lot going on in the Torah portion of Bereshit, but but the but it's a challenge that presents itself to us every year. Like we were so totally involved with Deuteronomy, with Moshe, with the Jewish history, and now all of a sudden, whoops, start all over again. I just want to say this one thing, and that is that this week on our special Torah portion video, Lights of the Nations, um, the Torah portion for this week, we will especially delve into an erudite treatment of this very topic, of what does it mean to go from the end of the Torah, the end of Deuteronomy, on Simchat Torah, we end, and we start reading a, uh, right away, Parshat Breshit, and we continue this Shabbat, we read the whole Parshat Breshit. What is that dynamic? How does it work exactly? What does it mean? What does it really represent on the deepest level? Stay tuned this week for probably the deepest Torah lesson that we've ever shared. Ever. Here you go, Yitzchak. Ever. Another aspect, Rabbi, of this whole season, this whole transition, I've noticed the book of Deuteronomy, which we begin to read, correct me if I'm mistaken, we begin to read it, uh, the Shabbat before Tisha B'Av, correct? Before the ninth of Av. Right. And because the second portion of Et Hanan always is read right after Tisha B'Av. The entire book of Deuteronomy 
uh, takes place over the last 37 days of, of Moshe Rabbeinu's life. Um, and we begin reading it then, uh, at the beginning of the month of Av, and we've read it throughout Av, throughout Elul, and uh, throughout the first three weeks of Tishrei. We've t and, and the last three or four uh, Torah readings are actually all take place on the last day of Moshe's life. And again, so that's another month, even longer, since it's stretched out. It's, it's almost six or seven weeks concentrating, focusing on a single day. And then we get to Breshit, Genesis, and, you know, six days of creation go by in a flash, and then another thousand years of, of the f history of man go by before the end of the, of the, of the parsha. So as we come to the, con the end of the year, the last month or two, we have this, you know, time is stretched. It, it, like it, it comes to almost to a halt, as, which is, is so, so um, appropriate for the, the, f the idea that we're supposed to be doing uh, tshuva, introspection, and, and really checking ourselves out and, and thinking about where we're going in life. That time comes, it, it goes by so slowly in a way, as is paralleled by the by the uh, by the Torah readings that you know we almost come to a standstill and you know that last uh, reading of uh, Zot Bracha you know even waiting I think almost three weeks to, to read it you know it's like we keep reading on, on Shabbat afternoon when you read the beginning portion of the next week's reading we keep doing it over and over again almost like Groundhog Day because it's times comes comes to a standstill almost as we are in this intense period of of repentance of rejuvenation of of recalibration of bringing on the new year and then just as on Shmini Yatzer at the eighth day which is so beautiful that we read of the first seven days of creation six days and then the seventh day which is Shabbat uh, that's what we read uh, from from the from the portion of Breshit on Shmini Atzeret, and then we read about the 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 offerings of the eighth day. So we read the first seven days, and then the eighth day. It's just a beautifully flows into the eighth day. That you know we come out in the new year after this above time, above space existence, especially in the sukkah. We come out running, you know, full speed ahead. You any preparations you wanted to make, you had a you had to do already. Like now is not the time to like say, wait a minute, I'm not ready yet. We're going full speed ahead. Six days of creation, Shabbat, and then a thousand years of the first generations of man. Whew, you know, you hardly catch your breath. You know, everybody knows that this whole Sukkot thing, it's called Zman Simchatenu. It is called the time of our joy. And more than any other of the festivals, it's associated with joy. In fact, the Torah actually commands us, <coughs> excuse me, on your festival referring to Sukkot, you shall only be joyous. There's something inexorably bound up uh, and integrally related with Sukkot about joy. And that joy, of course, culminates, the climax is with Shmini Atzeret, Simcha Torah, with the actual dancing with the Torah, with the completion of the Torah and the beginning immediately of the Torah, again, over and again, because it is timeless, because it, it is a continuum, because it never stops, because creation is always being renewed, because every single day God is creating all of us all over again. But, you know, um, it's funny that on the s intermediary Sabbath of Sukkot, the custom is in the middle of the festival, the, at the, in, the, in the, you know, like in the depths of the festival, the Shabbat Chol Hamoed, the intermediary Sabbath of the, of the festival of joy, the custom is that in the synagogue we read the book of Kohelet, the scroll of Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. which frankly for a lot of people is a downer. It is f seen by a lot of people as being kind of like a game stopper because it's somewhat, I don't want to use this word, and I certainly don't feel this way, but some people say it's depressing. Because Kohelet, who is actually King Solomon, gives this scathing review of the human condition. And basically, vanity, vanity, it's all vanity, hevel is the word. He talks about futility. 
He talks a lot about futility. He talks a lot about disappointment and frustration and despair and, um, and uh, man's foolishness. And it's kind of a, an interesting conundrum how people, you know, very often will say, isn't that strange? Like, why do we read that book of all books on Sukkot? And so some people think, well, you know, maybe you don't want to go overboard with your Sukkot joy and become, uh, and become frivolous or, uh, or, you know, silly, so therefore you have to keep it in check. That's not the idea. The idea is, what is joy? What really is joy all about? Actually, I've got to tell you also, Kohela is so beautiful. If you really study it as it needs to be studied, it is so amazing. It is really just the deepest of the deep, and it gives you such an incredible insight into what it is to be a person. And you know what? That's half the battle of life to know yourself, to know what life is really all about. That's where joy comes from also. And I think that the real reason that we read that book on Sukkot is because we really need to understand what is joy, you know? It's not about keeping uh, foolish joy in check. It's about understanding what happiness really comes from. It really comes from understanding our relationship with God, our place in the universe, what life is really for. And having said that, I, 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 and so to, I mean, to me it just made a lot of sense, okay? But I, I want to say this. You know, there's so much that we could talk about Parshat Breshit, the book of, the Parsha of Genesis. I mean, and every year, I mean, we sit here and go through this, like, what am I going to do? I'm going to start talking about the secrets of the universe as if I understand, which I don't understand anything in this world. I'm going to start to talk about, about God, about creation. You know, there are so many traditions, there's so much to learn, so many incredible insights about this Torah portion that it would take a lifetime just to study them. So, and, and here's the frustration, you know, we have, this is it, we're reading it this week, next week you're already going to talk about, you're going to want to talk about Noah, so like, by the time I get to even look at anything, like it's over, you know what, I want to talk about one thing, I want to talk about a background theme of this week's Torah portion, and again, again in, the, in our video this week, we're going to do something completely different. But right now, I want to talk about a background theme lurking, present, ever present, and ever constant in our Torah portion, and that is the existence of evil. Because the existence of evil is a, a, a major um, problem for a lot of people. It's a religious crisis for a lot of people. They say, well, if God is all good and love, then how could there be evil in the world? And they say, well, he couldn't have created evil, therefore there must be a devil, and he must be on equal footing with some other power, because he would never create evil. All sorts of things that are actually addressed very succinctly by the sages of Israel, and of course, make a very long story very, very short on one foot. You know, we believe, we believe that God left a place for evil to exist in this world. And this is very much part of Parshat Breshit, of the first Torah portion of the, of the Torah, uh, God left a place for evil in this world. He doesn't create it at all. He allows it to exist to facilitate the most important thing of all in life, which of course is man's free will. That man has free choice and that man has the ability to choose between right and wrong is the very reason for creation in the first place. And the whole thing is about free choice from the get-go, from this week's Torah portion, from eating of the tree, whatever that's all about. And through and including all the way to the end of the Torah portion where we come to a situation where because there was such a, a uh, preponderance of free choice, we have a situation uh, that really was uh, terrible by the end of the Torah portion. And you know, the most beautiful story uh, of the world, first, first, first let me say this, you know, in, in the Perkei de Rabbi Eliezer, Yitzchak, in that mm -hmm. Sefer, that ancient work, of the great Rabbi Eliezer that we love so much, he mentions there that um, teshuva was created before the world was created, and that God saw in the blueprints that the world wouldn't exist. Um, and so first he kind of made like a, as an underpinning of the world, teshuva, the concept of repentance. And then he saw that the world w would, would exist after, would be able to exist. And I think what that is intimating is that a man is a problematic creature, fallible, and therefore God hewed into the very fabric of creation from the very beginning the ability for man to... Reset uh, button. Hmm? A reset button. Yeah, 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 to return, exactly. 
You know the most beautiful story in the world about the two holy brothers, Reb Zushia and Reb Elimelech. Reb Zushia and Reb Elimelech of Lezhinsk, these two great tzaddikim that they, that they were very, very uh, amazingly holy. And Reb Elimelech asked his brother, he said, these great Hasidic masters, he said to his brother, look, I'm nobody, I understand about me, but what about you? How did you allow this to happen? That was a whole conversation. Mm -hmm. He said to his brother, how did you allow this to happen? Of course, he was referring, alluding to the fact that when both of them were, were um, included in the primordial soul of Adam, as we all were, when we were all wrapped up in that f first great soul, where were you? Like, were you sleeping? Like, how could you allow, have allowed him to do this in the first place? How could you have allowed him to eat from the, from the, uh, from the tree and mess everything up? For many years, uh, I heard uh, one version of the story that he answered him, a beautiful answer. He answered, because I wanted to know what it would be like to serve God with free choice. Because, mm -hmm. you know, this is plan B. This whole thing is plan B, you know. But then I, I heard that that's not really the answer that he gave. He gave an even more beautiful answer. And he said, what do you mean, how did I allow it to happen? I pushed him. Mm. Because it's so important for man to be, you know, not to be... Um, perfect, but to be able to distinguish between right and wrong, and to be able to have within us the, well, of course, that Yetzirah entered into the situation afterwards, we need to be able to choose the right way. And I think it's amazing that this, all this is going on now, as Hashem is bringing all creation into, into being one more time this week, as we read Parshat Breshit, and we just finished in the Sukkah, why am I bringing all of this up, and we're out of time in this half? Because, you, because we have been living through a very, very difficult week because our Sukkot joy has been marred by a spate of terror and senseless murder. And it's been a difficult Sukkot on that level. And all the wisdom of Kohelet can't put it back together again. And, and, uh, and, and we're speculating quite deeply about the existence of evil as we see what's been going on here in Jerusalem. And I want to give some examples and talk about that and talk about... Um, the reaction of the world to a lot of what's been going on here. And you know what? Once again, it's all totally right on schedule as Hashem renews creation and gives us the ability to choose, all of us, between right and wrong. And we'll be right back. Stay with us. And welcome back to a brand new year, Temple Talk. Not a new year. Uh, this is Yitzchak Rubin with me, Rabbi Chaim Richman, Temple Talk. We're at Temple Institute. And Rabbi has been talking all about uh, Parashat Bereshit, all about Sukkot and the joy of the entire holiday season, especially the joy of Sukkot in which we are commanded to be joyful. And I've even heard that if you succeed in being joyful on Sukkot, then you will have joy throughout the upcoming year. But the rabbi also mentioned that in the beautiful parasha of Bereshit, Genesis, the story of creation, um, we are confronted with the existence of evil in the world, and that's a troubling uh, thing to confront. And, but rabbi mentioned, I believe, that it's necessary that we have evil in the world so that man can have free choice, and that's what creation's all about. Not that it's necessary that we have evil. It's necessary that there is a place for it to and exist. necessary that there's a place for evil to exist in the world, and then... And it can exist. The rabbi mentioned that uh, even through our joy-filled Sukkot, there was much evil being uh, perpetrated against the Jewish people here in the land of Israel. Uh, terror, murder, murderous attacks, uh, just to um, 
Uh, I mean, many attacks occurred. There were two deadly attacks which left four people dead. Uh, this past Thursday evening, a couple was traveling in a northern Shomron, northern Samaria, and they were ambushed by terrorists uh, who shot and killed the husband and wife. Uh, You're talking uh, about Rabbi Etam Haken, Henken and, and his, his wife. wife. And uh, their four young children, uh, spanning in the age of four months to nine years, were in the back seat of the car only by a miracle. They have six children, four were in the car. Uh, only by a miracle were those children spared. And then um, Saturday night, uh, as uh, a couple and their inf and their infant and their uh, and a baby carriage were walking through the old city of Jerusalem to go to the Hoshana Rabbah uh, prayers in the uh, Western Wall Plaza, were ambushed by a teenage terrorist My with a team. knife, who uh, began attacking them. Another Jewish man. Uh, ran up to try to to save them, and he himself, he and the the 22 year old f husband and father of that infant were killed. And um, I just like to add that the the uh, wife uh, was very seriously wounded, and she was able to run to uh, 50 meters where there were policemen to get their help. And she said the next day when she came out of the operating room that she was running, she had a, a knife in her back. In her neck. And, she, and her neck, and she ran up to the closest people who were Arabs, who were st storekeepers, who were drinking Coca-Cola while I watched, and one person actually filmed the whole thing, didn't stop it, but filmed it, and they spat at her and laughed, laughed at her, her and said she's next. Listen, when, when we talk about the nature of evil, when we talk about evil, uh, well, at least when I do, I'm generally talking about Islamic terror. And uh, in this case, I also want to talk about the reaction of others to Islamic terror. Okay, so first of all, the Hankin Kampo, again, this man, a beautiful man, a great Torah scholar. By the way, uh, not that it makes any difference, because every time anybody is murdered, there is a part of us that is killed. Um, it is, however, a very small world, and w personal connections always drive the um, drive up the angst meter the trauma meter and the uh, meter of um, just how everything is is perceived again it doesn't really make a difference we're all in the same boat everyone that lives in this land pays a price everyone in that lives in this land pays a price for what we are doing for the effort that we are making to bring Hashem's sovereignty into the world and the price that we pay is with the integrity that we live and how far we are willing to go for for Hashem's name. But the fact is, this man was a classmate of one of my sons. The road that this took place on is a road that our children use every single day. And you know what, Yitzhak, I don't think I mentioned to you, but my other son-in-law, Israel, his mm -hmm. brother and wife were in the car right behind Wow. Hankins car because they went to the same uh, the same uh, affair it was actually mm -hmm. a high school reunion mm -hmm. and they also had gone and they were right behind them so um, the the murder that you just mentioned now okay okay so first of all okay the Hankins had six children four of them were in the car there's a lot of buzz going on in different parts of the internet about you know the fact that the kids weren't killed and you have some people that are saying that are talking about <laughs> i don't know if they're trying to say that the that the arabs are wonderful or that they're merciful or what they or or whatever but they're saying oh they didn't kill the kids well actually they didn't kill the kids either because they didn't see them or as was revealed today because one of them had a mishap and was shot in the hand by one of the other terrorists and when that happened he dropped his rifle and they all started to run so maybe they were about to kill the kids or as you said Yitzhak maybe they wanted the kids just to see their parents being murdered and that was enough for them but don't start talking to me about how about how you know there uh, there's something to talk about here because they didn't kill the kids because when the they came and they murdered the Fogel family they they butchered little babies and cut their heads off and cut their hearts out. So I, I don't think that th that is an issue. 
You mentioned the um, Mrs. Uh, Adele Benita Bennett, whose husband was murdered in the in the in the area of the Muslim Quarter, which is about a couple of meters from the Western Wall. I mean, it's literally next to the synagogue that all of my boys had their bar mitzvah in, right? Mm -hmm. And so he he was he was killed. Um, her husband was killed, and then another Jew who lives right there, uh, who heard what was going on, um, he ran to help, and he also was murdered. And so this woman is talking about how she was wounded, and she had a knife in her neck, and she's running, and all the Arabs along the way are spitting at her, kicking her, pushing her down, laughing at her, saying, die, die soon. And all of these unbelievable things that now it comes out that all this was filmed and the identity of all these Arabs is known and they're going to be brought to trial for incitement, failing to offer assistance and acting as accomplices, right? That would be new if that really happens. Um, all these Arabs who are hoping for her, for her quick death, who saw all of this, all of these Arab storekeepers that all, all our tourist friends stop and, and, like you said, buy their Coca-Cola and all this kind of thing. By the way, another, another major story in the news today here in Israel is this expose that the PA government has been paying convicted Hamas arch-terrorists sal monthly salaries for years. Terrorists who are in prison, who are Hamas masterminds, who have planned some of the most horrible uh, um, suicide bombings here in Israel, have been paid tens uh, of thousands of dollars um, by the Palestinian Authority, right? Your tax money, people. Your and tax so money. So in the meantime, you know, Abbas, the head of the PA, uh, went and said that um, Israel killed these two in cold blood killed these two young Palestinians. Right. These BBC reported it that way. Right. Referring to the, the perpetrators of these hor horrendous murders, Abbas stands up in front of the whole world and says that he needs, he needs uh, the world to come to his aid because Israel is going around killing young Palestinian men, right? The BBC gives the following headline. The headline is, Palestinian shot dead in aftermath of Jerusalem killings. And, and it's like Jerusalem killed people, right? Mm -hmm. So it's called Jerusalem kill, kills. The Palestinian was shot dead. It is just so absolutely outrageous. If you want to talk about sick ideas that are floating around, uh, another one is the idea that all this violence is caused by Jews wanting to pray in the Temple Mount, which is a total inversion of reality where for more than a year, Jews on the Temple Mount have been subject to brutal verbal and physical attacks without any intervention by the police and we have been shouting at the top of our lungs to anyone and not just shouting but meeting with members of the government for many months and saying this is what's happening it's out of control it's going to spread someone's going to be killed and now all of a sudden the journalists are waking up and said wait a minute let's take this and turn it inside out and report it all backwards jews are praying in the temple mount that's why jews are being killed it's a sickness. Hey, did you read that today that uh, the member of Knesset, Ahmed Tibi, said that the, the, this uh, uh, young Palestinian man was killed by the Israelis, the one who, who murdered, murdered uh, two people, Benita Bennett, because he was being chased by settlers and he was running to the police to be saved by these from, right. from the settlers who were chasing him. Mm -hmm. Listen, then you go like this, okay, and you read about how um, the United States... This is a headline, okay? The yeah, U.S. urges rapid end to unacceptable violence in Jerusalem. John Kerry says, Restoring calm and returning to status quo <laughs> will minimize the instinct for escalation. These people have these words as mm -hmm. if they're supposed to make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk about how... Uh, I forgot what country. Oh, oh, that woman with the stringy, uh, dirty blonde hair, uh, whose name I can't pronounce. Who's the the uh, the the, the, U, the EU? Um, oh right, yeah, I know. For Linda mean, yeah. I don't know. Something like that. I'm not yeah. going to bother to read her name correctly. Anyway, she said that the that the the murder of these Jews in Jerusalem is not helpful to the peace process. Not helpful. And that is, and that this Very is why they have to have a state. You see, because right. if you give them a state, they'll stop killing us. But what do you want from them? You know, they want a state, and so therefore they're killing us. So the Secretary of State, 
He urged Israel and the Palestinians on Monday to demonstrate calm and avoid further escalation. What does that mean, that Jews shouldn't walk in the streets? I guess that's the escalation is caused by Jews walking around because when they walk around, they get killed. So he's, here's what he says. Regarding Jerusalem, it is absolutely unacceptable on either side to have violence resorted to as a solution. And I would caution everybody to be calm, not to escalate the situation and to deal with this in a way that can find quick way back to the full restoration of the status quo where the chief administration is in the hands of the government of Jordan and King Abdallah. He's talking about the Temple Mount here. Who is the custodian, he said, referring to the Temple Mount compound where Al-Aqsa is located. And it is very important to maintain a sense of calm that will minimize the instinct for escalation. This stuff you can't make up. And the reason I, that this is so outrageous, right? I mean, we're talking about the mother, Miriam Gal, the mother of Benita's wife, Adele, who spoke at the funeral to the chief rabbi Lau about what her daughter had told her after the incident. She, he, she says, my daughter tried to run away with a knife in her neck. She tried to escape, but they, the Palestinians at the scene, wouldn't let her and shouted at her, hopefully you'll die too. You know what? For John Kerry to say, you know, that he's worried about escalation and both sides have to be careful, either this stuff is hopelessly, hopelessly, hopelessly naive, which is just, you know, ad nauseum to the point of, of, it, of it just being silly, or it is tremendously calculated and tremendously evil. And evil. I, unfortunately, would Jesus have to... Would have to lean towards this latter interpretation. It fits their ideology. Anybody who lives here, or who, by the way, now lives anywhere and is faced with Islamic terror, which you're not allowed to name, right? I mean, I mean, when the kid in, I uh, forgot what state it was, uh, Ahmed uh, made his clock that looked like a bomb and brought it to school, and the teachers got upset about it, then the President of the United States tweeted, Cool hey, clock, cool Ahmed. Clock. Would you like to bring it to the White House? You're what makes America great. <laughs> bring it to the White House, please. Right? You're what makes America great. Okay, it was the, the kid was wrongly accused. But what is, what is going on here? Right? The President of the United States tweeted Ahmed that he shouldn't feel bad about his clock. Did the President of the United States tweet the six Henkin orphans? that he will stand up to the promises that he made that the world is going to be a safer world? I don't think so. I don't think he can because like you just said, Yitzchak, the agenda that these people have is very, very specific, very, very particular, and it's got to fit. And Israel is in the way, right? Israel is in the way when it comes to Iran. Israel is in the way when it comes to everything. Just like, if I may say, the, the Native Americans were in the way of American progress especially following the, the post-Civil War years when the West had to be opened up, railroads had, 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 had to be opened up, and the safe passage had to be insured for the gold prospectors, and all the men, women, and children of all the Native American tribes had to be killed, and, and the millions of bisons had to be made extinct so that they would have nothing to survive from because America had its priorities, and therefore America had to lie, cheat, steal, and murder all of the Native Americans so that um, the American dream could be fulfilled. And so too now America has its dream of, of uh, whatever it is. And Israel is like the only thing standing in the way. And that dream is being facilitated by, by uh, the rise of Islam, whether it's the Islamic State or the Islamic Republic of Iran or the Islam that's now, that's now uh, taking over every continent in the world. And so here we are living in this land that God gave us and being the people that we are, trying to be the best people that we can be, bringing all this light to the world. And it's a very big problem. And therefore, you know, he, let me read it to you again. He says, John Kerry says, that he urges rapid and to unacceptable violence in Jerusalem as if it's coming from both sides. And so when I talk about Parshat Prishit, when I talk about the creation of the world and how everything is constantly being renewed, which is a major lesson of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and Sukkot, we're going to be talking about in tremendous, never before revealed detail in this week's video lesson. And Hashem creating the world all over again and giving us the opportunity to participate in the unfolding universe and choosing between right and wrong. Whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? When you, when, if, you, if you understand anything about Islam. We've been saying it all the time. If you understand 
what the motivation is. If you, do you did you hear what we just told you? It's a film. You can see the film if you if you have the 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 courage and if you have the the, the stamina and the emotional stability to watch the dis- the woman describing how she was running after she saw her husband murdered. She has a neck a knife in her neck and how all of these Arab passerbys and all you tourists who come to Jerusalem and walk through the old city and 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 buy your stupid olive wood camels and all of these <laughs> things, right? And you and, and all of these men who 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 haggle with you about 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 how much an item is? These are the ones that are looking at her bleeding to death, her dead husband on the f- on the floor, guffawing, laughing, pushing her, taunting her, kicking her, and then John Kerry comes along and says that the the violence is unacceptable from both sides, and and the this incredible illusion that these people have that that everything is going to be okay, that we're going to make peace, that we, all we need to do is. Retreat and 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 retreat more and give them their state and whatever it is that they want. Not pray on the Temple Mount. Not exist altogether because this and this is uh, again the the whole the whole the whole ridiculous nature of the of the of the uh, supposition that it's because of the Jews praying on the Temple Mount that these things are happening. They always wanted to kill us. The Palestinian Liberation Organization was formed in 1964 in Jordan before there was any. Jews on the Temple Mount or in Judea and Samaria, which is called the West Bank. It's about killing us. It's about killing every single one of us. And by the way, dear listeners, it's also about killing every single one of you. And it goes on and on. And it's just so amazing. The, the complicity, the duplicity, the hypocrisy. America just, just now, right, went and bombed uh, doctors Without Frontiers facility in Afghanistan, and 22 people were killed, if you want to say, murdered. It's appalling and it's horrendous. I use the words appalling and horrendous because when Israel bombed a UNRWA school in Gaza, uh, in Rafah, during the war last summer, and 10 people were killed, and the reason that we bombed there is because rockets and missiles were being fired on Israeli cities and civilians from that school, we bombed there. America immediately issued (coughs) a proclamation, a statement that this is appalling and horrendous, and there has to be an investigation. But you can see a, a, a video where a reporter from the AP asks a spokesman from the State Department regarding what just happened of America bombing and killing 22 people in Afghanistan who are innocent, who are from Doctors Without Frontiers, if, he, if it was appalling. And he said, if, you know, let's, I, we pray for the victims and we're so sorry, but let's not jump to conclusions. You know, we, 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 uh, these things happen and we have to have an investigation. But, uh, but America branded Israel as appalling and horrendous before there was any investigation because everything when it comes to Israel is about a double standard. And America, God bless them, does whatever they want, always did, always will, or at least always think they will. And Heinz Ketchup, it goes on and on. The one consolation that I have is that the Israeli Ministry of Health decided officially that Heinz Ketchup, which is, as you know, owned by John Kerry's wife, has the majority stocks in Heinz, is officially not considered ketchup because it does not have enough tomato content and you have to be, in Israel at least, you have to have 66% tomato in order to be able to call ketchup. And from now on, Heinz Ketchup, and of course Osim, the major producer of ketchup in mm-hmm. Israel, brought this to the courts. Right. And, Hi- and since Heinz Ketchup doesn't have enough tomato content, it's not going to be branded as a tomato condiment. And I'm not buying it anymore, that's for sure. I'm only that's buying Osim, sure. blue like and ketchup. white. But that's not what I wanted to say. I wanted to say, look at us. Look how great we are. Look how strong our barrel chested Netanyahu is who stands up to terror, who has declared an all-out war on terror. You know, by golly, maybe Jews are open targets in the streets. Maybe the Palestinians with CIA training and United States provided guns kill us, but we will not accept ketchup that's less than 66% tomato content. So don't start telling me about how strong Israel is or how weak. He we, also, we he also declared in the, in the UN last week that we will not succumb to Ab- Abbas's threats that uh, Oslo is over and finished and done with, but we will continue to strive for the two-state solution. Yeah, don't bring uh, up this Netanyahu in the UN to me, because Netanyahu in the, U- in the UN uh, really wowed them by saying Am Yisrael Chai, but the very same week when a Jew said Am Yisrael Chai on the Temple Mount, he was removed, he yes. was arrested for saying, I'm Yisrael Chai. So the problem by all begins by with who we are, what, what the orders are, 
what our self-image is, what our priority is, who, what our goal in this world is. And that's all about these days that we've just been through of Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret and Yom Kippur. And now, beginning the Torah again, are we going to stand up for God's honor in this world? That's what Israel is all about. It's not about demanding that Heinz ketchup isn't called ketchup anymore or we take it off the shelves. I don't care about that. But I do care about, about Kerry telling us that the violence has to stop. You're right, it has to stop, and we have to stop it. But it, it, it is not equivalent. And this heinous, horrible, appalling, disgusting sin of moral equivalency, that's the problem that America has, this moral equivalency, because we are up against a scourge, against a bloody, bloodthirsty monster that could look at a woman dying in the street and kick her and spit at her. That's what's happening here, and that's what we have to face. And that's the problem of moral equivalency that I think is addressed in, in this week's Parsha of Bereshit. And that is the challenge of mankind. Thanks for being with us. We've kicked off this new year to a quite a raucous start. We'll be back next week, Temple Talk.